thank you very much. I appreciate you being here. Appreciate the opportunity to talk to you about something that I think is kind of interesting and hopefully it'll be time well spent. As I begin the talk, let me just start with a quick story. So several years ago, my wife and I were at a, a, a public event and in the middle of this event, my phone starts going haywire. Okay, and so I'm pulling it out of my pocket. I'm opening it up. I'm trying to figure all of this out. She leans over and she says, what's wrong? I said, I don't know, but I think my phone is broken. It's making all kinds of weird noises. It's buzzing, and now it's got words on the screen. And so I tell that silly story just to illustrate a point, and that is we live in a day and a time in which technology is moving so rapidly that what was absolutely unheard of yesterday becomes fairly common today and is absolutely ubiquitous tomorrow. And so the, the topic that I'm going to address with you today has that same feel. The, mo the movement in this field, the movement in additive manufacturing, is just at such a rapid pace that what we can imagine and what we can keep up with, we don't, we're barely touching the hem of the garment. We're barely scratching the surface. So it's a very exciting field to be a part of and it's exciting to watch it along the way. So with that, let's go ahead and get started. I've outlined the talk here. Uh, we'll give just a little bit more of introduction, and then I'll go ahead and uh, talk about large-scale polymer manufacturing. What you see is a, a rather small residential type unit, all right, a 3D printing machine. Uh, it gets a lot of attention when we take it out, and so we'll talk about large-scale additive manufacturing. We'll talk about bio-derived materials as a feedstock for large-scale additive manufacturing, and then we'll basically wrap up from there. So what is, 3D what is 3D printing? What's additive manufacturing? So you work from a, a computer-aided design part, a CAD part, and then you take that surface, take that three-dimensional uh, uh, part that you want to make, you slice it up virtually, and then you lay it down path by path. So you're just building one on top of each other. When you get your finished part, you take it out of the machine and you can do post-processing if you want. But basically it's working from a three-dimensional computerized file, if you will, a virtual part, to a real part, one layer at a time. There are several different types of additive manufacturing or 3D printing. They have the same overall characteristics. They're building upon each other, layer at a time. There's several that I'm going to talk, uh, not going to talk about. I'm going to talk about the fused deposition modeling. That's polymer. Uh, that's what we're going to be talking about. There are several metal-based systems. They tend to work, again, the same way. They'll have a vat, if you will, of titanium beads, and they'll raster an E-beam or a laser beam. They'll fuse them together. They'll make one layer, and then they'll build it upon each other. The neat part about this is, oh, so there's several neat parts about it, several advantages of additive manufacturing. And so I've shown a few of them here. First and foremost, complexity is free. Once you figure out your tool paths, once you figure out that you've got a part that you can make in this way, then you can build a complex part just as easily as you can build a simple one. So the, the robotic arm that's on the left, that, that's cool to look at, but the really neat part about that from an engineering standpoint is all of the hydraulics and all of the things that you need to actually make that a working part were built when you made the thing. And so you don't have to go back in and re-add all of those things to it. It's built that way. That's the way it comes off the machine. With that, you have the opportunity for near net shape manufacturing, so there's less waste. You're not taking a billet of aluminum or a billet of other metal and then just basically shaving off everything that you don't want, creating a bunch of chips on the floor that you then have to try to recycle or reuse. So you have near net shape, less waste along the way. Another thing that we're able to do is in a lot of cases take steps out of the manufacturing process. We can actually go directly to part or make parts that have less shape or less time intensive operations, take some of these operations out of the way and build functionality into the, the part itself. So that's new. We're able to actually rethink the way that we build some of these parts so that we can build them the way that we need them to function instead of building them the way we've always had to make them. A lot of innovation goes in this. There's a lot of customization. If you can change it electronically, if you can change it virtually, then you can build it. And with a lot of these, you have decreased energy use. In a lot of cases, it's very large. So the, the additive manufacturing part can be one-tenth that of the normally manufactured component. And so we have a lot of opportunity to decrease energy use along the way. So several advantages. So how does it work? Let me elaborate just a little bit more. 
So you've got a extruder attached to a gantry. That's nothing more than a hot glue gun on steroids on an X and Y axis. Okay? So we've all kind of dealt with that, particularly if we've had kids in middle school. We've dealt with those projects. Yeah, I, a couple of them identified yourself. So we've got that. Uh, and that's what this is. So we've got this hot glue gun on steroids. It's moving back and forth. In this case, the platform of the machine itself actually changes so that you can build one layer upon each other. You get the rates right, you get the deposition right, the glue rate, the, all of that stuff is worked in and you figure it all out. So that's the first part. The second one is we're now able to go to a pelletized feed system. So we've reduced the cost and we've extended the life so we don't have to just have a single filament. We just keep filling the hopper with these pellets and keep putting them into extruder and just making bigger and bigger parts. But the secret sauce of this whole thing is we're making composites into the pellet. So in this case, the pellet, the tried and true thing that we're dealing with most, that we print most stuff with is ABS plastic. That's nothing more than Lego plastic. Okay, so we're taking ABS plastic and within that we put in a carbon fiber. That carbon fiber changes the mechanical properties and it changes the thermal properties of the overall system such that it lays down into a nice flat part. So we have the dimensional stability that we need. If you don't have the carbon fiber in it, these parts will tend to warp and bend and change as you manufacture them and as they cool. So we've got the dimensional stability, and then we're limited by the build volume, but we can build it in sections and you kind of get an idea of the part size that we can build. Speaking of the parts that we're using, everything that we've done so far with the large scale is on the BAM machine, big area edited manufacturing. You see the part volume there, the size volume, and it extrudes at about 80 pounds an hour. So that hot glue gun is moving pretty fast. It's moving pretty fast and we're laying down a fair amount of material. I'll give you some illustrations as we go through. We're working on the next one, WAM, wide and high additive manufacturing, and that looks to be an order of magnitude larger in every dimension. So now we're really starting to look at the ability to make very large parts. And there we're extruding or hoping to extrude up to a thousand pounds an hour. That's going to be pretty exciting for sure. So now that we can make a part, Let's do that. Okay, so the Shelby Cobra, I think it's back home where it belongs now. It's spent several weeks up here in the Forrestal building. This is not the way it comes off the machine. We actually did the post-processing. So you take it off the machine, it's got that layered look, then you machine it, you polish it, and then you coat it. And that's a part of what we were able to do here with the Cobra. We got a class A finish on it. We can put different nozzles on it so that we have different size of beads that we can use and do things like that. We've printed a car. We printed a truck. That's a printed utility vehicle, a PUV. We've printed a boat. We printed a submarine. We've printed all sorts of different things. And we put different coatings on them and start to figure out what they do. So it's not only a demonstration for additive manufacturing, it becomes a vehicle for different transportation and energy savings technologies. So we're looking at expanding and incorporating a lot of different things together. And apparently if the video is any indication, they're kind of fun to drive. Oh. So more to the point, what are we going to use this for? In this case, we've used this to make the molds for windmills. There's a lot of complexity in that. There's, it's not just a flat piece uh, that's made. There's a lot of shaping and contouring. And so that's ideally suited for additive manufacturing. You make the mold and then you lay down the windmill, the blade itself. The blade was not made with additive manufacturing, but the molds were. And so the shape that it has to have is built into the mold. The mold was built nine months quicker than what it would have been built through traditional means. It costs several hundreds of thousand dollars less and we're able to put additional functionality into the mold for thermal transfer and things like that. So it truly was faster, better, and cheaper. We wanted to turn our attention to bio-derived materials. If we can do this with plastic and Lego plastic, can we do it with, with wood? Can we do it with bio-derived materials? And so we looked at a composite structure of bamboo and PLA, polylactic acid. And here we're printing the parts to flotsam and jetsam. It was an architectural exhibit that was done about a year ago. 
And so we're printing the parts again, the same overall concept, layer by layer. We've got a mixture of bamboo. The bam yeah, it seems to hold up structurally just fine or the abuse of the engineers. And so the bamboo provides that fiber, it provides that dimensional stability. The PLA is the resin, the glue that holds everything together. And we printed these various sections and put them together for the Design Miami show. In a four week period, we printed about 10,000 pounds of parts for this. So it was moving and it was pretty exciting and a lot of things were going on. They put it together for the Design Miami show. We were a little chagrined that you could see the texturing and you can see some areas where it didn't lay down perfectly. The architects were like, no, 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 we don't want it to look completely smooth. We want it to look like this. It's more approachable for certain applications. That's what we're trying to do. That's a, a benefit, not a drawback. So that was a part of it. So moving from bamboo, what if we could use different types of feedstocks? What if we could use different types of materials to do the same basic thing? Bamboo is good, but it also has some drawbacks. It's an invasive species and it's generally imported. And so we worked with our plant biologist at Oak Ridge and we selected certain species of populus, more commonly called poplar, okay? And we did the same thing. We went through some mechanical milling that you see there with the blue machine. We sieved it into different sizes. That's what we've got here from coarse all the way to fine. We sieved it, we looked at it, and we selected this size right here. That gave us the aspect ratio that we're looking for. We compounded it, okay? And so it's about 15% uh, poplar, 85% PLA, and we made a part out of it. <laughs> I didn't forget <laughs> and donate the part to, to you guys. We made a part out of it. And this was basically all the poplar that we had uh, at the time. And so we've got more now. Uh, we're, again, we're going back to a certain select species of it. So we uh, can hopefully print larger pieces. There's a couple points that I want to make on this. This is mechanical processing. So it's inherently significantly less expensive than chemical type processing. This is commonly done. We went over to the University of Tennessee and did this in a series of days. The second part is, this is too fine to be used for additive manufacturing, but it could be a very good size for biofuel production. And so if we can integrate these processes, then we have the opportunity to generate two value-add streams, not one out of this overall processing. So we're pretty excited about that and looking forward to exploring that more this year. So what are the advantages? Well, they kind of drop out from what we've talked about. Lower cost and lower environmental footprint. And so if the energy intensity of an additive manufacturing part is one-tenth of a traditional manufacturing, then the energy intensity of something that's renewable is significantly reduced from that. So we have a very good opportunity to really reduce the environmental footprint. It's 100% renewable. It can be recyclable. We hope that we can chop it up and reuse it, add new materials, supplement it as needed. It's sustainable manufacturing practices. We can decrease the cost of biofuel production. But overall, the biggest advantage is we can bring in new ecosystems for manufacturing into rural, impoverished areas. And so if we can select various feedstocks across the country that grow well in these areas and offer advantages, then we have the opportunity to, to restore some of those industries that have gone away. So, Wrapping up, what's next? Well, it's really hard to tell, but overall, this is an extremely rapid growing industry. It's growing at greater than a 30% growth rate, which means it's going to be about $100 billion, give or take, by the year 2025. Some people think that's even a little low. There's a natural application right now in the tool and die industry because that complexity that we can build in allows us to onshore this industry and it allows us to save time, money, by bringing them to the US, so that's a good thing. Reduce time, lower energy costs, so on and so forth, regional manufacturing, but ultimately, I think time will tell. And I think no matter what kind of projections or, or speculation we might have, we would all be a little surprised in a few years at how commonplace it is and all the different ways that it can be used. So with that, just a few acknowledgments. First and foremost, I want to acknowledge the support from the department, uh, AMO and BTO. 
the support is gratefully, uh, we're grateful for it. It's an exciting uh, field. We have a team at work that has advanced the technology and helped with the slides, so I'd like to acknowledge them. And overall, we uh, also have a whole team and cast of collaborators that we work with that I didn't get to name on the slide, but there's just, this is not an individual institution's effort. This is a huge collaborative effort. And so with that, I'll leave you and thank you very much.